name's Jacob Prash, and tonight we'll be looking at Isaiah chapters 1 and 2, for then and for now. It is a passage and a series of subjects we have addressed before, but we want to put it into a new light in today's current developments of what's happening in the world and happening in the church in regard to the world, uh, and also in regard to Israel, in regard to contemporary events, looking at Isaiah chapter 1 and 2. Turn with me, please, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 1. Now, very briefly, as many of you would know, Isaiah was prophesying around the time of the Assyrian captivity having begun to the northern ten kingdoms in 722 A.C.E. thereabout, or B.C. thereabout. And up until this point, early in his ministry, and he was broadly contemporary with Micah, the prophet Micah, he was... in a relatively stable situation. There were some fairly positive kings uh, when Isaiah began, began his actual ministry. It was before bad kings like Manasseh came to power. Uh, the pivotal king was Hezekiah when the troubles actually began. But prior to that, there was a relative prosperity and a relative peace and a relative stability in Judah. That is the two southern, the southern kingdom of the tribes of Benjamin and Judah and the refugees from the north who came south when the northern kingdom backslid into idolatry and widespread immorality and debauchery under kings such as Ahaz, refugees came down from the north. The Syrian deportation had begun, but things were now getting underway. <clears throat> uh, there were a number of kings at this time, one being Ahaz, who was of, of, of some importance, but conditions deteriorated following the reign of Uzziah and Jotham, of Uzziah and Jotham. So by the time of Asa, Isaiah is trying to warn, and by the time of Hezekiah, things had made a sudden turn for the worst. We have to understand this. Things make a sudden turn for the worse. We see things coming, but they're always in the distance, not on the horizon. But as soon as they're on the horizon, they're upon us before we know it. That's what was happening in the days of Isaiah. The people in Judea, they thought, or in Judah, they thought these things were happening in the northern kingdom. They won't happen here. We have not got into the same level of debauchery and immorality as the people in the north or the idolatry. And what is happening with the Assyrian captivity and the Assyrian invasions of the other nations of the Middle East, it hasn't affected us. These are, as it were, news items in points further afield. But then by Isaiah's day, during the reign of Hezekiah, it comes to Lachish and then to Jerusalem's very door. What we're seeing now is the same kind of thing. We, for instance, have thought of persecution as something that happened to Christians in northern Nigeria or in Islamic countries or in China. Now we're beginning to see persecution of Christians in Canada and in, even in the United States and certainly in Great Britain. Uh, just last week, a gang of, 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 of Antifa activists were attacking evangelical Christians who were objecting to children being exposed to adult male homosexuals parading naked in front of them, and they were physically attacked and the police did nothing. This is not traditional America or traditional Britain or traditional Canada. But it's coming, and it's coming very quickly with militant homosexuality, with militant pro-death, that is, pro-abortion activism. And Christians are being increasingly, increasingly victimized and misrepresented by Hollywood, by Silicon Valley, by the mainstream media, 
and by the political parties, not all of them Democrat or labor. It's coming upon the church in the West at our doorstep. It has come to Lakish and will soon be pounding on the gates of Jerusalem once again. I'm, of course, making an analogy. Now, in situations like this, I always point out that the applications that it has for the church do not in any way negate or replace the actual meaning for Israel and the Jews. What happened in Isaiah's day to the southern kingdom of Judah has meaning, replayed meaning, what we call a pesher interpretation for the close of the age concerning Israel and the Jews, as well as application to the Christian church. We're not trying to replace what it means for Israel, on the contrary. But let's look at Isaiah. One of the most significant passages in the Hebrew scriptures that is important for both the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the New, and is, I would say, essential in evangelism and apologetics, is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. The appeal of God speaking through Isaiah, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. God wanting to reason with man about man's sin. God wanting to reason with man. Remember, Paul said that our faith is reasonable. God wants to reason with man. And he wants to reason with man about man's sin. Now, a common characteristic of those controlled by Satan and his power and his influence, who have always opposed the true prophets of God in the Hebrew scriptures, and have always opposed the faithful church, is that they're not willing to reason. They're not willing to engage reasonably about the issues, particularly about moral issues, or about any issue contrary to what they want to believe. Their reaction is one of anger and hatred, not of reason. They will not engage in reason. Well, we see this as a tenet of the Islamic religion. In the Islamic religion, you have, according in the Quran, al-Ashari, that the Quran should be accepted, bila kayaf, without asking questions. And in Islam, it should be accepted ta'abudi, without any concept of criticism of the content. In other words, you need to believe what the Quran says without question and without debate and without any criticism, simply because Islam says you should. There's no basis of apologetic in any empirical or intelle fair intellectual sense. In fact, the only Islamic scholars that are genuine scholars, independent academics, who are called Orientalists, they all teach in Western universities and they publish in the West. They would be killed in most of the Islamic world, and certainly they'd be giving no chairs or no positions in Islamic universities. Islam cannot allow critical scholarship. This is Islam. But it's not only Islam. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, promulgated his form of mysticism called exercises using visualization. Now, this is very dangerous, and it's a first cousin to things we see today with the new apostolic reformation and other people practicing missionist, uh, mysticism, pretending it's New Testament Christianity or New Testament spirituality, but it isn't. Ignatius Loyola said, if Holy Mother the Church, that meaning the Roman papacy, says it is daylight, even though we know it is dark outside, it's night, we must believe it is daylight because the church said so. 
This kind of suspension of reason, suspension of critical faculty. You throw your brains out the window and believe what you're told because you're told to believe it. This is fundamental to Roman Catholicism. It's fundamental to Islam. And of course, it is fundamental to the neo-Montanism of the new apostolic reformation. And we saw this in the counterfeit laughing drunken revivals of two decades ago. Just believe, just trust, don't try to discern. That's suppressing the spirit, they said. In fact, the scriptures command we discern. Nonetheless, forget what the scriptures say, just accept what we're saying. Don't question it or you're suppressing the Holy Spirit or you're going against God or going against Allah or going against Holy Mother the Church or whatever it is. Satan's premise has always been the opposite of Isaiah 118. Don't reason. Just believe what you're told because you're told to believe it and don't question and don't criticize. Or there's something wrong with you if you do. Now, this is not scripture. Our faith is reasonable. This has come into the mainstream world, even though the mainstream world claims to be post-enlightenment and have a scientific worldview. For instance, it began with the Darwinists, certainly. If someone were to debate Darwinism on the basis of mere scientific fact without reference to the Bible. If they were just to debate Darwinism on the basis of information science, on the basis of the second law of thermodynamics entropy, on the probability theorems, they would just be dismissed as unscientific. Darwinists would not deal with the scientific objections, most of them. Don't question, just believe what you're told. We see the same kind of arrogance combined with spiritual delusion in uh, Hariri, Yuval Hariri, the Israeli philosophical advisor to Schwab and the World Economic Forum. He just makes statements dismissing the believability of the Christian gospel and of the Torah of the Jews. And he states it as if it were a fait accompli, an absolute fact, that if you don't believe it, you're not being reasonable. You're, you're not behaving intelligently. He won't debate the issue or the substance. He, in fact, is in certain respects similar to Voltaire, the, the, the author Voltaire, in, in what he says and the way he go about things. Harari is, of course, a... a rabid homosexual, and he has a vested interest in rejecting both Christianity and Judaism because of his homosexual lifestyle. But it goes beyond this. Look, if you want to debate global warming, if you want to debate global warming and climate change, as far as they're concerned, you're the same as a Holocaust denier. Its proponents will treat you like a Holocaust denier, as Ben Shapiro pointed out, and, he, and he's right. They won't consider the facts. They won't argue. Reason becomes suspended. We have seen this among lunatic fringe so-called born-again Christians with their counterfeit revivals and now in the new apostolic reformation. We've seen it in the ecumenical movement. We have seen it certainly in Darwinism. We see it in the pandemic, the politicization of the pandemic. We see it in Islam. We certainly saw it indisputably in Soviet Marxism. If you raise the fair question, wait a minute, Marx was a Hegelian, and therefore he was influenced by Darwinism following Hegel's philosophy of the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. So Marx concluded that as capitalism evolved from feudalism, so communism would evolve from capitalism. And England being the first capitalist country would be the first communist country, because that's where the Industrial Revolution began. That is the first capitalist country. It couldn't happen in Russia, said Marx, 
because Russia was still feudal, it was too primitive. Well, instead of communism, the Bolshevik revolution taking place in England, a Bolshevik revolution took place in Russia, not the first of the capitalist countries, as Marx said, but in the last of the feudal countries where he said it would never work. Now, everybody knows that. Every historian knows that. Everyone knows Marx was wrong, but it's not up for discussion. It's Vestia Pravda. Russian academics, they just wouldn't deal with those issues. It will be blotted out of the textbook from schools. As we always say, thou shalt not think, thou shalt not question, thou shalt not ask. We've seen it in communism, Marxism. We've seen it in Darwinism. We're seeing it today in the politicization of, of pandemics. We're seeing it increasingly in a number of areas, certainly in the area of abortion. Wait a minute, these fetuses are surviving earlier and earlier in gestation. How can you justify terminating a pregnancy when babies younger than that are already alive in incubators. They cannot medically or scientifically contest it. It's just, we don't reason. You just believe what you're told without reason. God gave man intelligence. God wants to reason with man. God claims to have the answers to why man and his world are so messed up. God claims to have the solution to the problem that we've gotten ourselves into. And he wants to reason about it. And he says foundational to everything having gone wrong is sin. He wants to reason. God is a God of reason. Our faith is not an intellectual faith, but it is intellectually credible. The claims of Jesus are empirically examinable. They are not a blind faith. It is not like Islam. It is not like Hinduism or Buddhism or shamanism. It's not like those. It is reasonable. It requires spiritual revelation, but not to the negation of reason. Paul gave an apologetic. Jesus appeared to over 500 people after he was crucified and resurrected. He gives reasons. From the first evangelistic sermon in Peter's Kerygma on the day of Pentecost, you know that Jesus did these miracles. You witnessed that he, he gives reasons. God is the God of reason. The fallen world is unreasonable. Satan wants people to be not only crazy, he wants them to be stupid. He wants them to be unreasonable and yet think they're reasonable, as Paul would write. Professing to be wise, they become fools to their own destruction. No, Isaiah 118, come let us reason together. And so Isaiah begins. And he begins by talking about a nation that once knew the truth. As America, Britain, these nations once knew the truth. Let's begin in verse 2. Listen, O heavens. Hear a word, for the Lord speaks. Sons, I have reared a board up, but they've revolted against me. This is apostasy, rebelling against the Lord by those who know the truth. An ox knows its owner, a donkey its master, and its master's manger. In other words, where it gets fed. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Why not? Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly, they have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. 
They've turned away from him. When a nation, when a society, when a people backslides, something happens to them. They don't know anymore. They just don't know what they used to. These people don't know why children are being shot in schools. These people don't know about the breakup of the family and absentee fathers. They don't know why these things are happening. They tried to look for some kind of an economic, political, or sociological explanation. But the political, sociological, and economic explanations are merely ramifications of the spiritual one, sin and rejection of God. Verse 5, where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there's nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil. The society is damaged. The nation is damaged. The church is damaged. And it's not being healed. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Not to take a political route, but just look. Every major city in the United States controlled by the political left who rejects God's word the most. Not that they're not hypocrites in the Republican Party by any means. But you look, Philadelphia, Detroit, Baltimore, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, these cities are being systematically destroyed by auto destruction. They're destroying themselves. Your land is desolate, cities burned. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. This desolation is overthrown by strangers. Illegal aliens are pouring into Europe from Africa and the Middle East. They're pouring into the United States in an open border policy, allowing in Chinese fentanyl to kill people in the inner cities of America. is happening. And these illegal aliens pouring into Europe, into Britain, into America, the drain they are on the social services and on the job market, taking employment away from indigenous people and adding to the crime problems and social problems. Strangers are doing this. Now, I'm not anti-immigrant in terms of people who enter a country legally. But how can Muslims come as refugees from Muslim countries and then try to bring the same Islam with them? An economic refugee is not a refugee. There may be a legal immigrant who comes for economic reasons, but a refugee comes as a result of a war. And the daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Everything becomes a mess. But the source of it, the source of the social, political, and economic problems they had and that we have was sin. But nobody wanted to talk about it. And then in verse 9, it really begins. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would be like Amara. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gemara. You can read one historian after another. Arnold Toynbee, among many others. A hallmark 
of a culture, a civilization, an empire in decline is the proliferation of homosexuality and lesbianism. It is a sure sign of social destruction. And it's being mainstreamed. I tried to go in, or I did go in, to a supermarket in Great Britain the day before yesterday. I was forced to walk by a homosexual rainbow flag saying that the store supports this agenda. A small, relatively small percentage of the population. You don't see people saying you, the store supports Christianity or anything like that. You have to pay homage to this, as it were, to go shop in their supermarkets. This is Waitrose, but there are probably others doing it as well. The Biden administration last week announced it is going to withhold federal funding for school lunch programs for needy children unless the curriculum of those schools overrides parental objections and teaches small children that homosexuality and lesbianism are normal and they have to discover what they are and what they want to be as little kids without any reference to parental responsibility and rights without any reference to the faith-based values of the families they come from. You must teach this in the schools or we'll let the kids go hungry. That is how wicked, that is how wicked our leaders have become. That's how wicked the leaders of Israel and Judah became. People like Manasseh, just wicked people, wicked. It's what was happening then. It's what's happening now. Verse 11, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? Those who are pushing this homosexual lesbian agenda. I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling my courts? You bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense, which is the prayer of the saints in Ezekiel and Revelation. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I can't endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I can't endure your incense. Your prayers are an abomination. I think of that son of the devil who died Boxing Day, Desmond Tutu, whose daughter was a lesbian priestess, who said he would rather go to hell than to heaven if heaven was homophobic. He will not worship a god who does not approve of homosexuality. Well, he got his wish, but he was all dressed up in his religious vestments. And he had Christmas and Easter, and he burned his incense. And now in all likelihood, he is burning in hell. when you spread out your hands in prayer. I'll hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan, and we have a new kind of orphan now, children born out of wedlock, absentee fathers, plead for the widow. The largest purchases of handguns in the United States right now are black American women. Because of the defund the police and all these other things, 
the murder rate has skyrocketed in the black communities of America. These women are seeing children shot on their way to school. They are buying guns to defend themselves. And so the government is trying to take away their right to defend themselves. Unbelievable. Who is going to plead for the widow and defend the orphan? Defend the orphan. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they'll be like wool. I can give you a way out of this. I can show you how this went wrong, says the Lord. If you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. But they don't want to reason. They do not want to discuss any of these e issues reasonably. Having children out of wedlock and not calling it immoral, aborting babies, not calling it immoral, engaging in unnatural sexual practices, not calling it immoral. Well, God's judgment reached Jerusalem in Isaiah's day. How the faithful cities become a harlot. She who was filled with justice, righteousness, once lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silvers become dross. Your drink diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. The leaders of most Western democracies Canada, Australia, the United States. They are in rebellion against God and they are the companion of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe. They do it for money. They'll sell their own countries down the river to the communist Chinese who are persecuting Christians. They don't care. It's about money. They love a bribe. They chase rewards, but they don't defend the orphan. Nor does the widow's plea come before them. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, ah, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself and my foes. I will also turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross with lye and remove all your alloy. Then I will restore your judges as at first and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you'll be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. The court system in the United States, the European Court of Justice, these judges are godless, wicked people, most of them. They're sons and servants of hell. There's not righteous judges. Now again, this relates to Israel. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. But transgressors and sinners will be crushed together and those who forsake the Lord shall come to an end. That is what happened to Judah in the days of Isaiah. And that is what is going to happen now, both to national Israel and the Jews, and to the Judeo-Christian world as a whole. Surely you'll be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired, that is making idols from wood. And you'll be embarrassed at the gardens which you've chosen for you will be like an oak whose leaf fades away or a garden that has no water. Notice the New Ages and Buddhists and things have these holy gardens. Catholics call them grottos to marry. And the strong man will become tinder, his work also a spark. Thus they shall both burn together. There'll be none to quench them. 
Oh, good heavens. This goes on. The word of the Lord, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now it'll be in the last days. Now he's speaking, not for his own time. He's speaking for the first coming of the Messiah and for the second coming of the Messiah. In other words, he's speaking for our day more than his own. It'll come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. This, of course, is a reference to the millennial reign of Christ when the nations will worship him in Jerusalem, as we read in Zechariah 14. It switches to a coming millennial context. Many people will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his path. For the law, the Torah will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Jesus will teach the inhabitants of the earth about eternity for a thousand years before the eternal new heaven. He will judge between the nations. He'll render decisions for many peoples. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and they will learn war no more. Lo isa goy la goy hered, lo yil madu od mil hama. Only Jesus can bring lasting peace to this planet, and only Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua HaMasiah in Arabic, can bring peace to the Middle East, not the Abraham Accords that are going to set the stage for the Antichrist to bring a false peace to the Middle East. Come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord, for thou hast abandoned thy people, the house of Jacob because they are filled with influences from the East. And they are soothsakers like the Philistines. And they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. We've explained this many times before. I would point people and ask them to read the book by the Moriel missionary director from Thailand, Brother Scott Noble. Bell on the Morio website, how Eastern mysticism has invaded the church again. This happened with the post nicene church fathers, it happened with the Crusades, and it's happening now again. Influences of the East. In Judaism, Kabbalah is simply Babylonian Gnosticism put into Jewish terminology the Ein Sof, et cetera. The demiurges of New Age, it's all the same. It's all from Babylon. Eastern religion, yoga. These things have overtaken Israel and they have infiltrated the church. There was a deceiver of the devil named Patrick Dixon in Britain, a physician who wrote a book arguing once that altered states of consciousness, as you have in Hinduism, are the same as manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Manifestations of the Holy Spirit are alternate state of states of consciousness. And the, theolo the distortions of scripture that that guy tried to use to explain or prove his thesis were absurd. He wrote from the devil. Consciously or unconsciously, cognizantly or incognizantly, he wrote from the devil, altered states of consciousness, and he was teaching this as Christianity. They're soothsayers like the Philistines. They're into the occult. 
Their land has been filled with silver and gold and there's no end to their treasuries. Their land has also been filled with horses and there's no end to their chariots. And their land has also been filled with idols. They worship the work of their hands, that which their fingers have made. So the common man has been humbled and the man of importance has been abased, but do not forgive them. What we see now is what Hariri is saying is going to happen. Through biogenetic engineering, man with biogenetic engineering will replace Darwinism. We will control it. Now, what he's really saying, he doesn't know it is, we're going to replay the Tower of Babel scenario where we will deify ourselves or attempt to, but God will again intervene. The man of importance will be debased. And there'll be no forgiveness. They will have gone too far. Enter the rock. Hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. The proud look of man will be abased and the loftiness of man will be humbled and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. On that day. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 6. Once more, look at Isaiah chapter 2. What are they saying? Enter the rock, hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord. Direct reference to Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. And they said to the mountains, to the rock, fall on us, the rocks, and hide us from the appearance of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They can dig as many fallout shelters as they wish. There'll be no hiding from the wrath of the Lamb on that day. And that day is coming. For well, the Lord of hosts, in verse 12 of Isaiah 2, will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty, against everyone who's lifted up, that he may be abased. And it will be against the cedars of Lebanon that are lofty and lifted up. Now, if you listen to our tape, our, our recorded teaching on temple typology, we show that the cedars of Lebanon, what their symbols are. If you don't know, you'll be shocked. But they're going to be abased. And against all the oaks of Bashan, against the lofty mountains, against the hills that are lifted up, against every high tower, every <coughs> fortified wall. And I would also point you to our teaching on the ships of Tarshish, available on the Hoyo website, verse 16, against all the ships of Tarshish and against the beautiful craft. Now again, these things like Oaks of Bashan, Cedars of Lebanon, Ships of Tarshish, they're all symbols of things covered on our other teachings. <clears throat> Obviously, for the sake of brevity and time, we can't explain them all now. The pride of man will be humbled. The loftiness of men will be abased. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. <clears throat> but the idols will completely vanish. And the men who go into the caves and rocks and into holes in the ground, because the terror of the Lord and before the splendor of his majesty, when he arises to make the earth tremble. In that day, this is talking now 
about the time period between the fifth and sixth seal, the sixth seal. The rapture comes between the sixth and seventh. This is the sixth. They'll cast away their moles and their bats, the idols of silver and idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils. For why should he be esteemed? Stop regarding man. There's only one man worth looking up to. It's not Jacob Prash. It's certainly not a politician or a film star or a pop star or an athlete or a business model. There's only one worth looking up to and that's the Lord Jesus. The only people you should pay attention to are the ones who look up to him. Well, let's look up to him. Remember, the time frame shifts and Isaiah goes from talking about then to now. From his time to our time. Isaiah chapter one and two, then and now. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash from Morio Ministries, coming to you on RTN Christian TV, Scotland. Every blessing. <laughs>